मुझे बहुत प्रसन्नता हो रही है आप सभी का स्वागत इस उद्घाटन समारोह में करते हुए यह उद्घाटन समारोह छः दिवस दिवसीय भारतीय भाषा महोत्सव के उपलक्ष्य पर रखा गया है और इसका आयोजन किया है सेंटर फॉर ह्यूमन साइंसेज ऋषिहुड यूनिवर्सिटी ने भारतीय भाषा समिति मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ एजुकेशन गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया के साथ मिलके और इसमें हमारे मुख्य अतिथि हैं प्रोफेसर रा, राजेंद्र कुमार अनायत जी जो कि वाइस चांसलर हैं दीनबंधु छोटू राम यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी सोनीपत के मैं आज के मुख्य अतिथि जी से निवेदन करूंगा कि आएँ और अपना वक्तव्य यहाँ पर दें i may take an excuse today in speaking or delivering my i don't call it as a discourse or i don't know how should i call it but it is more maybe you may feel it like a classroom lecture because uh, when i was called for this program i thought uh, i must look into the content first and uh, when you listen me next 30 minutes or 40 minutes and when you go back from here since this is being such an important program in the country you should take something back it's not that everything i am going to share with you is something new to you i don't think <coughs> but definitely you will get something from here yesterday i came back very late from delhi because it was in the constitution club we had a uh, human rights uh, program then came in the very late night and then had a look then i was asking myself like uh, uh, what is that uh, which made me to stand in front of you today what is that qualification i have everything is against because i am a mechanical engineer i specialized in printing i did all life engineering jobs i was a machine builder of course uh, i am a lover of languages no doubt about it as someone rightly said uh, i speak uh, most of the south indian languages hindi uh, english little bit german all these languages i i i, I can manage this is what so i felt uh, i am qualified maybe <laughs> because of that that's the only thing so i want to take you through the uh, world of languages in three different ways so the uh, part one i just want to share with you the evolution how this language has come very very short and then in second part i try to touch upon what are the languages we speak in india and how that is evolved this is the second part and the third part is more of the real subject in discussion today uh, what are the benefits of being multilingual not just uh, a local language alone i am telling but being multilingual what are the benefits you are going to get so this is the way i want to take you through so to begin with let me say adab because in kashmiri you say uh, welcome then namaskara namaste vanakkam namaskaram in malayalam we say namaskaram my mother tongue is malay any malayali is here i don't know my in my language we say namaskaram all all same but there is a slight difference that's all in punjab when you go you say sat sri akal you may say somebody say pranam and all these are or maybe khemcho gujarati you may say so all different ways we say but the meaning is same this is what make india very different from any other country you see the the what made mankind what it is today is only because of communication nothing else science social sciences objective sciences all these came on a later stage but the first and foremost thing is the development of languages so there are two different theories which uh, 
talks about this communication and languages, the famous linguist Noam Chosky, he totally differs what uh, Darwin's theory, because he said that uh, uh, there could be maybe 100,000, 200,000 years ago, there uh, one mutation happened in one of the genes, and from that genes onwards, the language started to communicate. This is what he says. But if it gets proved, the issue is Darwinian theory will be obsolete. So I don't think it can happen in that way. He says it is step by step. The development of language is totally different because look at the animal kingdom today. Uh, what, how it was communicating 5,000 years ago and today is the same way. Everything, reason being, what an animal kingdom could do is only react based on instinct and impulses. A grazing animal which can go smell the grass and if it is eatable, it can eat and walk away. This is what maximum it can do. Nothing more than that. But human is totally different. It's not the way. Because we have been blessed with an extra element called the intellect, buddhi. So we have a completely developed sharira mana buddhi when you take that fully developed intellect we have. That intellect helps us to question looking at the universe and the planet Earth, why, why, why? The same thing uh, Newton also asked when the apple fall down, why it has down, come down? Everybody would have seen that. Maybe uh, you and me would have asked why you waste your time. My grandfather's time also it was coming down, what is there to ask? But he told it may be right, but I want to know why it is coming down. And he got into gravitational force and that's the way the science developed. The questioning ability in every human helped us to progress. The very same thing, in the form of a communication, if you look, it started as body gestures. That was the first thing we started. And then it came to sounds like uh, uh, ululations on those days, what you call more like a, then it came into musics and poems and all those things. And then hieroglyphics. Look at all the cave paintings and carvings and then the communication moved to hieroglyphics and then it uh, went to the oral tales because early days we didn't have a particular method to record what we want to communicate. So we made it an oral tradition, rhetoric. Look at the Vedic tradition. We made it a poem or a shloka for chanting so that it become rhetoric and you remember it in your brain. So that's the way they communicated. And then it came up to the written literature. I mean, then came to the field where I worked as an engineer called printing. Printing is something 500 years ago, 600 years ago, changed the whole world. What internet is doing today or did today was done by printing 600 years ago. Record says Gutenberg invented printing because everyone says that, but that is not the true story. 700 years before, Gutenberg, a gentleman called Bai Sheng in China who developed the first clay printing press. And in that clay printing press, the first book ever printed was an Indian book. It's called Diamond Sutra, Vajra Sutra. It's a Buddhist work, which was the first book ever printed. So that's the way our connection, Bharatiya connection with the printing and recording something which is developed in this way. And it took another 700 years to move this technology from China through Arab traders to Europe. And since Gutenberg was a metallurgist, he's a blacksmith, his metallurgy knowledge was wonderful. He designed a printing press and started the next history of, ma I mean, massive production techniques in printing started by Gutenberg. And that was the way it has gone. And now we have come to the com computers and robotics and artificial intelligence based literature where even the human imagination creativity started a big question. So this is the short uh, history of communication literature what I can do. So when it started it was just a medium of expression for human creativity and imagination when literature came into existence. And also to deal with the speculative questions like uh, uh, what is God or philosophy or ethics or morality, all these were requirements on the, those days. Then it was this communication and literature used to entertain 
to educate and influence people. Then move to the next role, it depends on changing with the times, types of changes. With the establishment of organized states powers, that we wanted to control the human mind through propaganda. Literature was used for propaganda at some time. The Soviet literature is the biggest example of that time. So this came into existence of a literature which went beyond dimensions and entertainment and education. That's, that's the next form it has come. I'm sure you must have seen George Orwell's novel 1984, which was written in 1949. The novel name was 1984, points to this horrific fact, because it is, it is not a dystopian uh, novel that uh, hints at an imaginary world, but it is a reality which came into this. And in today's world, you know that a lot of graphic novels and literature, which our children are through into that, which gives you seamless opportunities to communicate well. So this is the a short intro or the development of literature in the part one. And now in part two, uh, when I looked at these details, I could see that uh, the oldest language is the Sumerian language. As per record I am talking, even though we claim in India, Sanskrit is the oldest, Tamilian tells Tamil is the oldest, Kannadiga says Kannada is the oldest, but with the available records and proofs, it is accepted in the world that Sumerian language is the oldest one, which is 5,500 years old. Then the second oldest is the Egyptian language, which is 4,700 years old. Then comes the Sanskrit, which is 3,700 years old. Then comes the Greek and Chinese and Aramic and Hebrew is the way the language, uh, languages, these are the oldest languages. Now, when you look at the typical Indo, uh, Indian language system, I, I was just noting it yesterday, just for my understanding. The languages spoken in India, if you take this, there is a uh, organization called Ethnologue. I'm sure literature students must be knowing it. Uh, they have done a study which classified almost, almost 448 languages existing in India. And this PLSI, People's Linguistic Survey of India. You must be knowing about that organization. As per their study, they say 780 languages in India. But the Indian census, 2011, which is updated in 2018, the latest updation which says in India, we have 19,569 languages, spoken language, I mean dialect. This many dialects we have. And uh, when you look at from the mother tongue side, it is almost 1,369 languages available. And out of all the languages available, 121 languages we have in India, which is spoken by more than 10,000 plus. Minimum number, I'm telling. So if the minimum number of speakers is 10,000 or above, there are 121 languages available in India as of today. And uh, 66 scripts we have, out of which the very famous script is, of course, Devanagari, what, what we all use now. And India has two official languages, Hindi and English, so I am qualified to speak in English too, being an official language. And uh, 22 scheduled languages. These are the things what we have. In one picture, what I can tell. And why we talk about India, Hindi, there is a reason, which I will come into that. Out of all these languages, what we have here, the Indo-Aryan literature, lang language if you take, 78.5% is from the Indo-Aryan tradition. That's what absorbed from there. And the Dravidian languages in the south, which is 19.65%. And there is another small sect of uh, language, which is Astro-Asiatic, Sino-Tibetan, and the Thai Kadai, etc. All these together, it comes around 2.3%. So this makes the 100% languages available in India. So Indo-Aryan is 78.5%. Just remember that. This is the way the distribution of languages in India. And Hindi is widely spoken, no doubt. 52.8 crore people in India can speak Hindi very well. They accept Hindi as their mother tongue too. And 43.6% consider is 
Hindi as their first language, I mean complete mother tongue. Why this 52.8 is, the remaining people around, uh, I was just looking around 13.9 uh, crore people, other than the English speaking region, can handle Hindi, like me. My mother tongue is Malayalam, but I can speak Hindi. So like me as a second language or a third language, these people, they can handle Hindi. They are around 11 crores. So altogether, the percentage of people who can handle Hindi very well, which comes around 52.8%. It's a wonderful number. That's the reason why we all should promote Hindi. It's much easy. How China has become China? Because of the Mandarin. They did it. With otherwise, they, what they were speaking in Shanghai was totally different from Beijing. But they did it, and China got united. If at all you want to unite a country, I think you need to have a common language. Otherwise, we cannot have that feeling what I am speaking. If you don't understand the language in which I am speaking, that has no meaning. So almost 55% of the population can speak Hindi, and this is the only justification to spread it to the next remaining 45% in a better way, in the possible way. And another interesting uh, fact what I want to tell you is out of the regional languages, only one language which has really grown better than others I am telling, not the number I am telling, percentage wise, that is Punjabi. Punjabi speaking people have grown up from 1972 to 2011 I am telling the exact number which I have. Bengali speaking people from 8.17% has gone down to 8.03, I mean 0.14% reduced. But Punjabi has gone up almost 0.17% from 2.57 percentage to 2.74. This percentage is taken from the total population of the country. So don't uh, confuse with the other number. Number of speakers are increased from 1973 to today. But overall population of the country and the percentage when you take, you will see this difference. Another language which has gone down is Malayalam. It has gone down, the, I mean the lowest, 1.12 percentage has gone down, speaking people. Urdu also 1.03 has gone down. Marathi speakers are two times increased. And when it comes to English, there are only 2.6 lakh people in India out of the 138 crore people, only 2.6 lakh people consider English as their mother tongue or a first language to communicate. But still most of the communication happens in English in India. Why it is so? What changes we need to make? We have to think all those things. So, but what it says is almost a 10% of the population in India can easily handle English, whether they speak it or not. So that makes around... Uh, No, no, that makes around 15% uh, uh, of the total population. So this is the way the Indian language is distributed and spoken and evolved in India. This is my second part, what I want to tell you. Now I want to come to the third part, that is, what are the benefits of knowing a language? If you don't learn a language, what will happen? All these are questions which we should know. Everyone asks me why you should read a novel. What is the purpose? Better physics, I know there is a purpose. But what you do with a novel? Wh whether you read it or not, what will happen? I can tell you, this is something which every individual should understand. Reason being, you have a very small time in your life. You yourself can never take to another position to understand how others feel. The typical altruistic feeling in you, or if you want to know what is altruism, without literature you can't do that. For example, when I read Anna Karenina, maybe uh, I may, a, a, a model, a, a person like Anna Karenina in my normal life I may not like. But when I read that novel, or when I read a similar novel, maybe another example I can tell you, Suppose I want to know the life of a prostitute, how can I know it? I have to read a novel where it talks about the life of a prostitute so I can put myself into her shoes and I can take myself into a different level, a different world where I can experience what is that life. You just tell me if you don't have a literature, how can you do that? What is the life of a police officer? How you know it? Unless and until you have a novel in which you yourself plays in that position and read it, 
then you can understand what is, this physics cannot do. This mechanical engineering cannot do. So the typical altruism, if you want to make yourself a good human being who can understand the pain of others, or once somebody asked Ramana Maharshi, I remember, how do you deal with others? We would have taken n number of hours to answer it. Ramana Maharshi answered, there are no others. Because there are no others means to, re to reach to that level, no, you take time. So unless and until you are not able to take you to that position, you won't be able to see this world so beautiful. You won't be able to know uh, what, what is the need of the society, how we should plan ourselves. Or you cannot understand that pain of the other guy. So it's more of that aparabodham. In Sanskrit, you can say that aparabodham, the feeling of the other. No physics can do that, the feeling of the other. If you don't have, what is the purpose of a human life? If you are not able to understand the feel of a third party, what is the purpose of life at all? So unless and until we, ha we don't have a, if we don't have literature with us, I tell you, my dear friends, the whole life is waste. That's the reason, one of the reasons why we are assembled here to know about languages, its uh, multiple languages, its benefits and all other things. So now, those who know one or more languages may actually look and work differently than those who are monolingual. There is a difference. So what does it mean to know a language? Language ability, I tell you, basically two types. One is an active one and another one is a passive one. The active one is the speaking and writing, which all of us do. Another thing is listening and reading. The passive one is listening and reading. So these are the two active and passive components of learning a language. And maybe a balanced bilingual person can handle two languages same way almost, but very difficult it is. Normally you will have an upper hand in one language, little more. You may think that I am good in two languages or three languages, but it is highly, highly impossible. There is a slight difference. You go and ask Shashi Tharoor, he speaks in Hindi, doesn't mean that his Hindi is as good as English, there is a difference. And he's trying to speak in Malayalam today. I've seen him, a lot of activities doing in Malayalam. He's slightly, I mean, trying to pick up the languages, lot of mistakes in that, but no problem. With all the courage he's speaking and taking it forward. So learning language, you know, at any time you can think of it. So it need not necessarily be equal, but there are few cases where you may see. So most bilinguals around the world know and use their language in varying proportions depending on the situation. Uh, as you rightly said, with your kid and wife, you speak in Hindi, because that is what you prefer to speak. But when you come to a place like this, where, where you want to deal different students, kids, from all parts of the country, probably you may have to speak in English, no other option. So this, depending on the situation you do. Same way, the language learning also dependent on the situation from where you learned it. So. From this situation, how you learn, it can be classified in the, I am talking about the typical linguistic theories I am telling, in which uh, three types of people, they learn languages in bilingual or multilingual. Number one is the compound, compound bi bilingual. It is more like an additive bilingual, you can say. It means, uh, 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 suppose uh, you are shifting from here, Murthal to America tomorrow you have a small child with you. The way how she is going to learn a language, English there, and your Hindi at home is called a compound language, uh, bilingual learning, because she uses a single technology to learn both. She don't need two different coding for that. A single coding will help her to grasp both languages and it naturally happens. And that naturalization of English of this kind of kids when they are small, move to some other place, it, it just happens and it's difficult for you to make out. When you listen Rishi Sunak, without his photograph and video, you always feel he's a typical Brit. There is no difference. But when you look at his face, you will find out, oh, he could be an Asian, Indian or Pakistani or I don't know, whatever, or a African, whatever it is. So this feel you get only when you see, because he's a compound bilingual guy. He speaks Hindi too. He can speak a little bit Punjabi. So this kind of people are called the compound bilingual learners. The second type is called coordinate bilingual people. I am a coordinate bilingual. 
Reason being, I did my schooling in my local language called Malayalam. Then, then I moved to Pune to do my engineering, where I did my engineering. And that time, as you rightly said, everything was coming in English and it was flying above my head. I was not able to understand what they were speaking, but I put all my effort and I learned it. And slowly, slowly I started communicating in Hindi, English, little bit in Marathi, all these I started. And this, this type of coordinate people, what they do, they are not like the first one, not the single coding. We, we coordinated, use our existing knowledge and try to adapt it and make it as perfect as possible. So what happens at times when I speak or somebody like me speaks, maybe somewhere else that my mother tongue touch will come in my tongue. It should come. If it's not coming, I'm, I'm rejecting my mother. I can't do that because that's the language I learned. It happens for people like me, a, a coordinate bilingual person, very rarely. But since we have put every effort and developed the skills in communication, it's possible for us to speak very well. There is no issue. We can make without any mistake. We can write well. We can use every vocabulary and do it. But it may not be like a natural speaker. It's not needed. I mean, that naturalized one. You can't differentiate. But many people, if you keen go into that, then you can differentiate. There could be a difference. And the third is the most interesting. And the coordinate bilingual people are also called uh, subtractive people, subtractive bilingual. The first one is an addictive bilingual. This is subtractive bilingual. And the third one is more like a subordinate bilingual. The subordinate bilingual is like my parents. Suppose I am bringing my parents to US or here. I don't think they can learn anything new because their everything is already filled in their brain. And they try to learn. Of course, they will understand. But they have to filter it through their language which is already there. So that filtering process happens in the brain. So the influence of that language will happen. Need not necessarily be an old man to do this. Don't think so. Even youngsters, it happens. I was just noting a typical example while I was dealing with my own students in the campus. When my students come to me, they tell me, Sir, I want to, I want to give my examination. I want to give examination. Then I saw in Hindi, I have to give exam. I have to take my examination. The correct English could be, I want to take an examination. But it is not the mistake of this guy because he's a coordinate bilingual. He is thinking in Hindi. Hindi me I say baat karta hai. Sir, mujhe exam dene ka hai. Exam dene ka hu hi, then he try to translate it. Translating me kya hota hai? I want to give examination. So I'm just telling a small example. So this is the way it happens with the coordinate people. Now I want to know another thing. Maybe a coordinate uh, linguist like me, I may try to act as if. I also speak like a natural thing and all. But somewhere it comes out, as you rightly said. In the dream, no. The real language comes. There is a Birbal story, you must be knowing that. Many of you must be knowing that, because there was a very great linguist came into the court and he can speak n number of languages and they were not able to make out what was his mother tongue. Everyone tried failed. So Akbar told Birbal to find out. I will give you 24 hours, find out. What is his mother tongue? He don't know what to do. So he was thinking, how can I make out? Because pronunciation, accent, everything just like natural guy. Not able to find out what is his mother tongue. So what he did when he was coming, coming out, he took some water and splashed. The moment he splashed the water, he said, Are sale. First reaction comes from in, within. Vaha acting nahi salega. It just comes from inside. This is what happens with the coordinate bilingual people. So he said, Sale, your mother tongue mujhe pata ho gaya. So this is what it, it may be just a story, but this is what it happens. So this is very important in this. So uh, this is the way language learning can be classified into three types. And the recent advances in brain imaging technology have given neuro-linguists neuro a glimpse into how specific aspects of language learning affect a bilingual brain. They have conducted a lot of studies in that, and which says it is well known that the brain's left hemisphere is particularly meant for languages. This is what, there is no hard and fast rule. 
देखो देर इज नो साइंटिफिकली प्रूवन दिस आर ऑल स्टैटिटिक्स नंबर दे हैव टेकन सो लेफ्ट हेमिसफियर इज मोर डॉमिनेंट एंड एनालिटिकल इन लॉजिकल प्रोसेस सो दिस हेमिसफियर इज मोर एक्टिव द राइट इज मोर एक्टिव इन इमोशनल एंड सोशल वंस दो दिस इज अ मैटर ऑफ डिग्री नॉट एन एब्सोल्यूट स्प्लिट दिस इज वॉट आई वॉन्ट टू टेल यू सो दिस डिपेंड्स so the fact that uh, language involves both types of functions while lateralization develops gradually with age has led to a theory which is called critical period hypothesis this is this is what they say so according to this theory children learn languages more easily because of the plasticity in their brain uh, why because the brain is developing it is not yet over and lets them to use both hemispheres बट हमारे केस में क्या होता है हम ऐसा ही ट्रेनिंग किया छोटे उम्र से आज तक अभी तक आ गया सो मे बी यू वुड हैव यूटिलाइज योर लेफ्ट साइड टू लर्न यू यू विल योर लैंग्वेज एबिलिटी विल नेचुरली गो टू द लेफ्ट मेजॉरिटी विल गो टू लेफ्ट बट देर आर फ्यू पीपल फॉर देम इट गोज टू द राइट टू बिकॉज देर आर मोर इमोशनल बिकॉज द राइट साइड इज हैंडलिंग इमोशनल्स एंड ऑल बट चिल्ड्रेन एडवांटेज इज वॉट when they are put into different language uh, uh, i mean gamut they use both brains left and right so they may register in left and right so they can learn left and right this is what i can they are neither left nor right so they easily pick up but our problem is there is a limitation because of this because which is already lateralized so uh, another thing if this is true learning a language in childhood may give you a more holistic grasp that's the reason many of our relatives in us and australia and germany they speak their language as it is which you can't even make out but you and me if go there and try to learn it that makes a difference and uh, <clears throat> the uh, childhood may give you more holistic grasp of its social and emotional context because they are moving with that society from childhood onwards and conversely recent research showed that people who learned a second language in adulthood exhibit less emotional biased and more rational approach this is very interesting fact which all of us should know suppose you know two languages just imagine then you want to deal with the society or some activity with your second language you will be more rational you will be more logical aapka mother tongue mein mauka diya to you will be little perverted there is a possibility for you to but you try to it it all happens suppose we are going for a, a, a british embassy program you naturally you wear your coat tie jacket suit then when you go there the way you behave is a bit different it happens because of the language so the second language what you uh, what you are going to deal with a problem you will be more logical rational it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, pr it's a proven fact in the uh, in the research so there will not be any emotional bias and more rational approach when confronting problems in the second language than in the native one but regardless of when you acquire additional language being multilingual gives your brain some remarkable advantages this is the best part of the science it is already proven if you can handle more than two languages three languages there is less probability for you to get alzheimers there is less possibility possibility for you to get dementia so like that all those diseases no where you want to use your brain and intellect which will be in a better control and these people who can speak different languages till their last day they will be active they can think in a better way they can give a logical conclusion in a better way so this is very interesting study reason being what they say is this the higher density of that gray matter in your brain that contains most of your this neurons and synapses so it they, it it helps you to uh, i mean enrich all the activities in this brain by uh, to i mean your your toggling it's mo more like a to toggling happens in the brain i am i am speaking to you in one language after some time i want to speak to another language this immediate changes no will it's more like an exercise what you are going to giving to your brain and which will help you to become a better human being so this heightened workout a bilingual brain receives throughout its life 
So it can also help delay in onset diseases. This is what I was telling, like Alzheimer's, dementia. All the, they are telling at least five years to six years, seven years. You will get a delay at least to get a Alzheimer's. So, but the thing was, somewhere in 1960s, before 1960s, the same scientists were thinking, by giving an extra language to a kid is burdening him or her. It is ridiculous. And they think that only single language will learn everything. It is not true. Now the research has shown those people who are handling different languages and they can learn science also well. There is no issue at all. So this is the latest uh, uh, conviction from the language side what it is. So uh, what I suggest you is, uh, it is not late. If somebody in this hall is not doing two to three languages at least, you can start now because it is never late. Uh, it can strengthen all your, uh, this, uh, what is that, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, no? This is what it, which works for all this kind of thinking process in the brain. It will get much better activated and you will perform in a much better way in the coming time. So, what I suggest now, don't leave that opportunity now. Because learning a language, extra language, it will always give you an extra mileage and an extra advantage. Not only that, what I want to tell you, there is a story, you must be knowing that, uh, a rat mother and her two kids was chased by a cat. No other option. It ran fast, got into a uh, rat hole. It went inside. After that, the mother rat saw the cat is sitting outside. So what it can do? The mother cat, what it did, no? It barked like a dog. So after listening this, the cat thought that some dog has come. It ran away. So they came out and saved. So if a, if a simple rat can do that, why not us? Make use of this opportunity of learning a new language and it can give you some opportunity in your life and it can bring a better health, better thinking and better future. With that note, let me conclude thanking each one of you. Thank you.